Welcome back. This time round, we're going to take a look at the uh, the Acorn Electron. Uh, this is actually the very first machine that I owned um, back in sort of the end of 1985. A, a BBC Micro with a, a floppy drive and a, a monochrome monitor was about sixteen hundred and fifty odd dollars. Um, but then the Acorn Electron was released, and my recollection was they were around four to five hundred dollars and moderately compatible with the BBC. And of course, we had the BBC at school and at, at college. Um, the basic was compatible; it was based around the same processor. Um, there are a few few differences to do with performance. Um, the Electron didn't have quite as many expansion ports, and notably, didn't have the uh, the teletext mode 7 that the BBC's had. But otherwise, it was a really fun little machine to have and I spent oh, more hours than I could, more, more hours than I'd ever want to admit to uh, programming on the Electron. I didn't really use it for gaming. Um, I was more into programming. Um, so yeah, I finally managed to acquire one after years and years of wanting one but not being able to find one. So. Uh, yeah, let's have a look at it. So this Electron's in uh, pretty reasonable condition uh, given its age. Um, just looking at the side, we can see we've got a, a cassette port, an RGB video port, a composite video port, and a UHF port. Uh, on the back, we have an expansion connector, and on the other side, we just have a power connector. Um, and not really much on the bottom except a a serial number. The power supply, um, power supply is 19 volts AC, 14 watts, and this particular one is a British power supply, so I'd say this machine at some point has been imported from the UK, which is not surprising because they were a lot more popular in the UK than they were in Australia. So I have one of these um, plug converters obviously doesn't convert the voltage, but that's okay because the UK mains voltage and frequency is the same as Australia. So it's just the, the format of the plug that needs changing, not the voltage and frequency. So we're all good there. So I think probably the first thing to do is find a video cable and uh, yeah, see if this thing works. All right, so we've got our video cable. This is just going to be composite and I believe the composite on this machine is going to be monochrome. So let's power it up, see what happens. As Dave Jones over at the EEV blog would say, don't turn it on, take it apart. But I actually want to see if it's going to work before I take it apart, at least that way I know if I broke it or not. So let's plug it in, see what we get. And there we go. We have a startup screen. Wouldn't call, I wouldn't call that a keyboard test, but superficially at least the keys seem to work. So, good sign. Let's uh, turn it off and we'll have a little bit of a poke inside and see what revision board this is and, and what makes it tick. And taking this apart should only involve a small handful of screws. And these appear to be <coughs> into plastic, so we're going to have to be careful. I don't believe there's any hidden screws under the feet or anything silly like that. At least that's my recollection from, I don't know, 35 years ago when I was a kid, who may or may not have had his electron apart more times than he cares to admit. And we do have to be careful here because there is a keyboard cable between the upper and lower parts of the case, which we can see in there. So we do have to be careful and unplug that. Because we don't want to break it. Right, so nothing earth shattering with the keyboard. It's just a keyboard. So inside the machine, what have we got? We've got the 6502, we've got 
the ROM, which is going to have the operating system and BASIC in it. Um, I need my glasses. I've got my glasses, but I still can't quite make it out. Um, yep. So you've got RAM chips, one, two, three, four. Um, and we'll get to how the, the Electron deals with its RAM uh, shortly, but it, it's kind of unique. Um, and it's part of what leads to its performance issues. We can see here, uh, power cable's been squashed. It should be down in the gap there, and it wasn't. Yeah, so no real surprises in here. Little, little baby speaker, that's about it. Um, so this is an issue four board, um, and I think they had boards from issue one to issue six, if I remember correctly. Um, and the brains of the operation in this machine is here, is the ULA. Um, yeah, is the ULA there. Um, if that thing fails, the machine is just toast. We might, I, I might put up a, a quick view of the schematic and you can see that the, um, the ULA is the heart of everything. The CPU can't even talk to the RAM without going through the ULA. And that's mostly to do with how the memory is accessed uh, by the system. On issue one to four motherboards, of which this is a, an issue four board, the ULA had issues similar to those experienced by many other socketed uh, integrated circuits. And that is that the, uh, the heating and contraction cycles caused the, the chip to lift out of its socket and it resulted in startup failures of the machine. Um, and that was despite, like here, we've got a metal clamp holding the ULA down. And even despite that, the uh, ULA still on some machines used to work its way out of the socket. Uh, issue five and six boards, apparently, um, the ULA was soldered to the board. Um, and we'll have a look at some of those, some of those boards. So the issue one board, um, it's hard to tell from the image, but it, it almost looks like one of the later revision ULAs. But you know, if you look at the board layout and just sort of memorize that a little bit, and then we, we look at the issue two board, uh, the issue two board, the ULA is clamped down and we notice there's an extra ROM socket. Uh, the cassette relays moved and just generally that left hand area of the board has changed a little bit. Um, I don't have an issue three. Issue four is a different clamping arrangement on the ULA again. Um, and even the one pictured in this, this example um, is different to the one that's in my actual machine. So you know, clearly there were variations even within particular issues. Issue five, I don't have an example of. And issue six, the ULA there looks kind of similar to the issue one board to be honest, um, but apparently this one is actually soldered to the board, uh, which of course makes it uh, a lot more reliable. Also a lot, lot more painful if you ever have to replace it, but um, makes it more reliable. And this one, so this is odd again, the cassette relays back up next to the ROM. I'm almost wondering, I mean, it does say issue six on the, on the board in the image and in the previous one, with that style of chip and that position of cassette relay does say issue one. So I'm a bit confused by that, but yeah, I, I almost suspect one of them is actually not an issue. Either, either the issue one is not an issue one or the issue six is not an issue six. It's, uh, I'm not sure I, I have to do some more research on that. One of the gotchas with the way this, this ULA works is it accesses the RAM four bits at a time, which means it's actually got to access the RAM twice to retrieve one bit of data. And it does that from what I can tell by reading the four bits, latching them in the ULA, reading the other four bits, latching them into the other, into the, either the top or the, the other four bits anyway of the byte, and then returning them back to the processor or you know, feeding them into the video circuitry. Um, and the, the catch with, with doing that is that the more video memory a display mode uses, the less 
time the CPU has to access the RAM. And in some modes, the video hardware uses all of the RAM bandwidth during each display line, and the CPU is literally halted for that the period of that display line. So we'll have a look at that in a minute. We'll um, plug the oscilloscope in and connect that up to the CPU, and we'll run some just basic test loops in the various display modes and get an idea how much slower they get. Okay, so what we can see on the scope is the clock signal on pin 37 of the CPU in screen mode 6. Now, I've deliberately set the time base the way I have, um, so it's looking just like a, a big block at the moment. But you can see that the, uh, the clock is pretty consistent. Now, if I go into a screen mode that requires more screen memory, like, say, mode 2, we can see the gaps there in the, uh, in the trace. So if I just pause that, you see the gaps there where the process is getting no clock. And that's the ULA. The, the ULA is using all of the memory resources to display the video. So it's freezing the, uh, the processor clock uh, while it's doing that. And each of those gaps would correspond to one scan line in uh, screen mode two. And it's the same in uh, mode one and mode zero, and I think mode three is the same. So this is one of the big differences between the BBC Micro and the Electron. The BBC Micro, the, the CPU runs at uh, two megahertz, and it, irrespective of the screen mode, it runs at two megahertz. Um, whereas the Electron, because it's sharing the memory with the video system and because it's, the memory is only four bits wide, so on, so on, so on, um, it ends up having to uh, essentially halt the processor by um, stretching the clock. And yeah, you, you have a performance hit as a result. So we'll run some, uh, just some simple loops in basic in a minute, and we'll get an idea just how much of a difference that actually makes between the various screen modes, because it is actually quite dramatic. Okay, so I've disconnected the oscilloscope and, and turned it off, um, just because we don't need that for this part, and also so I can just get the case back together, make it easier to work on. So I'll power it back up, and if we do just a basic loop, so um, we'll go T, so we'll just, whoops, what happened there? T. Okay, have I got a, <laughs> there's my first fault. I have a shift key that doesn't work. Um, time, oh, I actually wanted T, T percent equals time. Oh, I can't type. 24i equals 1 to 10,000. Next. 30 print time minus t percent. So all we're doing is getting the value of the um, internal time variable, which is just a, a second counter, doing a, a loop, 10,000 iterations, and then printing out the difference. So if we run that, this is in mode six. Seven hundred and nine. And just for giggles, we'll run it again just to make sure it's consistent. Actually it's clearly not seconds that time variable. Maybe it's some um, tenths of a hundredths of a second. I can't remember. It's been a long time. Right, so that's in mode six. So we go to mode five. Yep, yeah, and 709 again. We go to mode four. 708, 709, much of a muchness. Mode three. And I think this is the first one where we'll start, well, I would expect that we would start to slow down. Yeah, 1194. So considerably slower in uh, screen mode three. Go to mode two. And I expect it's gonna be slower again, because if my recollection is correct, screen mode two uses even more screen memory than mode three does. 1491, so yeah, slower again. Um, and we go into mode one. 
which I think will be about the same. Same amount of screen memory, so I expect it would be about the same. 1475, yeah, pretty close. And in mode zero, I reckon it'll be the same again, because again, it's the same amount of screen memory that the ULA has to get through to uh, generate the image. Yeah, 1472. So, yeah, I mean, we can see just in basic a fairly dramatic uh, reduction in the machine's performance as we go up through the screen modes. And as I said before, that's something that doesn't happen on a, um, on a BBC micro. It's worth bearing in mind that the sharing of the memory resources through the ULA only applies to the RAM because the RAM's used for the generation of the display image. And of course, you don't display the contents of the ROM on the screen. So what that implies, correctly, is that access to the ROM occurs at the full two megahertz. So that, yeah, the processor can actually execute code at full speed from the ROM, whereas it, it can't from RAM. And that's interesting when you consider that most, if not all, of the, the ROM cartridges that were produced for the Acorn Electron that plugged into the plus one expander behind the computer, they were pretty much all implemented using the ROM filing system where the code on the ROMs was just downloaded into RAM as if it had been loaded from cassette or a floppy disk and executed from there. If the code had actually been reassembled to operate from the actual ROM, it could have run it near on twice the speed. So not quite sure why they did that, but anyway. So thanks for joining me today for the quick look at the Acorn Electron and the, uh, the ULA within. Um, I do have some other goodies coming for this machine, so uh, hopefully in the not too distant future we'll uh, explore it a little bit more. But until then, if you like what you saw, feel free to tap that like button, subscribe if that's what you want to do, and yeah, feel free to leave any comments down below on things I might have missed or things you'd like me to cover in future videos. Until then, cheers.